In the midst of Hitler's World War II victories, on May 10, 1941, a Scottish peasant named David McLean witnessed a peculiar incident. At midnight, while he was at home, he heard a sound and went to investigate. He discovered a German military plane on fire nearby, with the pilot descending on a parachute. As the pilot landed and approached McLean, it became apparent, based on his attire, that the man was German. McLean was struck by the pilot's elegance and the beauty of his watch. Instead of hostility, McLean offered the pilot hospitality, and after a brief conversation, the pilot introduced himself as Captain Albert Horn. He revealed that he had a confidential message for Duke Douglas Hamilton. Subsequently, the Scottish National Guard took custody of Captain Horn. When Duke Hamilton met him, Captain Horn disclosed his true identity, saying, I am not Albert Horn. I am Rudolf Hess, the deputy Fuhrer of the most important man in the world at this moment, Adolf Hitler. You are watching War's Impact, where the smoke clears, stories remain. Rudolf Hess was born in April 1894 in the El Ibrahimia neighborhood of Alexandria, Egypt. He was the son of wealthy German parents and received his early education at a German school in Alexandria until the age of 14. While in Egypt, which was under British rule at the time, Hess developed an admiration for the British colonial model. He held the belief that there were two distinct groups of people, one destined to rule the world, exemplified by countries like Britain and Germany, and the other destined to be subservient to others. In 1908, he and his family relocated to Germany, and in 1911, he began his studies in economics, in accordance with his father's ambition for him to eventually assume leadership of the family business. But on June 28, 1914, World War I broke out after the assassination of the Serbian student, heir to the Austrian throne, and his wife. This prompted Hess to join the German army and participate in some of the most intense battles of the war, including the Battle of Verdun. He was awarded several medals, including the Iron Cross of the Second Class and the Cross of Military Merit. Despite being shot twice in the arm and chest, he refused to abandon the army and instead requested to work in one of the most dangerous units in the German army, the Air Force. Before embarking on his career as a pilot, World War I came to an end with Germany's defeat and the signing of the Treaty of Versailles in 1918 which many historians have described as bearing in its womb the embryo of World War II. The treaty imposed on Germany after World War I resulted in the country being stripped of its heavy weapons, conscription recruitment was canceled, and the army was limited to only 100,000 troops with no air force. The naval force was also restricted to just 15,000 troops, and Germany was prevented from constructing submarines. In addition, Germany was compelled to pay compensation of 269 billion Deutsche Marks. The Germans saw this treaty as a humiliating agreement, and it was a major factor in the country's severe economic and political crisis. As a result of the people's outrage, Nazism was born. After World War I, Hess was discharged from the German army, and his family's property in Egypt was confiscated by the British. In Germany, a new generation emerged that was critical of German politicians and curious about the reasons behind their defeat. This generation was divided into right-wing and left-wing groups, with the majority being semi-armed. Hess was part of one of these anti-Jewish groups and took part in numerous street battles during the early 1920s. Additionally, he was studying history and economics at Munich University, where he encountered Professor Karl Haushofer, a former general in the German army who became one of the most influential figures in Hesse's life, and who strongly advocated for the concept of living space, or in German, Liebenschraum. Hess later presented this concept of living space to Hitler, leaving a remarkable impression on him. Hitler used this idea to justify Germany's expansion into Eastern Europe and the occupation of some European states during World War II. The aim was to maximize Germany's resources and develop it as a superpower. In 1920, Hitler and Hess met for the first time. Hess was greatly impressed by Hitler, and he was fully loyal to him. They both agreed on the treachery of Jews and Russian Bolsheviks towards Germany. This theory was popularized at that time as the stab in the back. That same year, Hess also met his future wife, Ilse Prohl. 
on their first date, Hess told her he believed that Hitler would free Germany from the Treaty of Versailles and also solve the whole of Germany's crisis. In 1937, Hess married Ilse and had their only child, Wolf Rudiger Hess, named after Hitler's nickname Wolf, as a symbol of his love and devotion to Hitler. In 1920, Hess decided to join the Nazi party as its 16th member. At that time, the Nazi party was just a dream, lacking practical thinking about how this small party would change Germany's entire future. Even with Hitler as the party leader, its popularity remained limited, making it impossible to gain power through elections. From 1921 to 1923, the opportunity appeared as Germany experienced a period of hyperinflation. The dollar reached the 1 trillion German mark in 1923, this economic crisis provided an opportunity for Hitler to attempt a coup against the government. On November 8, 1923, Hitler, along with a group of Nazi elite forces, stormed a political meeting of state leaders in Munich in an attempt to overthrow the government. Hess participated in the execution of this break-in, but he was not one of the planners. After the coup's failure, Hess participated the following day in a street march during which Nazis and police exchanged gunfire, resulting in the deaths of 16 members of the Nazi party. Hitler, along with others, was detained and sentenced to a five-year prison term. These relatively short sentences were a result of the judge's sympathy and Hitler's growing popularity at that time. Hess initially escaped to Austria, but later returned to Munich upon hearing of Hitler's arrest. He was subsequently arrested and sentenced to 18 months in prison. During their imprisonment together, Hitler and Hess's friendship grew stronger. Hess assisted Hitler in writing and editing his book, Mein Kampf, or My Struggle, which was completed during this time. Through their conversations, Hitler developed a better understanding of the concept of Lebensraum, living space, and its expansionist ideas. Hess became Hitler's private secretary while in prison, as he saw in him a loyal friend. He was the only one of Hitler's friends who didn't seek power and remained faithful to Hitler and the Nazi dream. They spent almost a year and a half in prison. It was after their release that Hitler's political journey began. In 1925, Hess was officially appointed as Hitler's secretary, and in 1929, he became Hitler's assistant. Hess was among the few individuals who could meet Hitler without an appointment. A year after Hitler became the Führer of the German Reich, Hess was appointed Deputy Führer. He played a prominent role in presenting Hitler to the German people through his speeches and marches, displaying great enthusiasm. In his eyes, Hitler was the embodiment of Germany and vice versa. He genuinely believed that Hitler was the alpha and omega of everything in Germany. As World War II began and Hitler's rise to power continued, Hess, who held the position of Deputy Führer and was third in line for succession after Hitler and Hermann Göring, started to feel marginalized. He was excluded from important meetings, including those related to the planning of the Polish War and Hitler's visit to France. As Hitler's power increased, Hess faced competition within the Nazi party, including individuals in secondary positions, such as Albert Speer, who developed a close friendship with Hitler, and Martin Bormann, who was Hess's own assistant and eventually took over his role, deciding who could or couldn't see Hitler. Hess's relationship with Hitler underwent a significant change, causing him to feel isolated. As a result, he began to occupy his time with astrology, telepathy, and magic. One day, a staff member saw him staring strangely at a chair and asked him what he was doing. Hess replied that he was trying to move it remotely. Over time, Hess's peculiar behavior began to draw the attention of Germany's top leaders. Speer, quoting Hitler, said after his conversations with Hess, every conversation has become a painful and intolerable torment. He always brings up unpleasant issues, and he doesn't want to forget them. Another phrase went, I hope he never has to take power from me one day. I don't know who I would feel more sorry for, Hess or the party. Hitler was too preoccupied with the ongoing World War II, and German aviation at that time failed to secure victory in the Battle of Britain. Additionally, Hitler was preparing to wage war against the Soviet Union. Therefore, the psychological state of Rudolf Hess was of little concern to Hitler. Hess's admiration for Hitler's personality from the beginning of their friendship, along with his unwavering desire to remain close, prompted him to contemplate a means of rekindling Hitler's interest. This ultimately led to his idea of traveling to Britain as mentioned earlier. Hess began training for his flight to Britain 
ordering modifications to the plane he would pilot, converting it for single-person operation, and added an extra fuel tank. As Deputy Fuhrer, his requests were promptly executed. On May 10, 1941, several days following his final interview with Hitler, he wrote a lengthy letter and instructed his assistant to deliver it to Hitler if he did not return within four hours. Imagine this person had limited flying experience, flew alone over a vast distance, faced the risk of being targeted by both German and British air defenses, navigated through intense warfare, made his first ever parachute jump when his plane ran out of fuel, and yet he succeeded in his mission. All of this illustrates Hess's remarkable loyalty to Hitler and his ideals. Hess had no idea of the power that Churchill wielded or of the manpower or firepower that England possessed. In a conversation with Duke Hamilton on the second day after his parachute landing, Hess declared that he had come to Scotland to negotiate a peace in which Britain retains most of its colonies outside of Europe, while Germany controls Europe entirely. This would have made sense if Churchill had not been the British Prime Minister as he had complete confidence in his country's ability to win the war and anticipated that the United States would support Britain, which indeed happened. Moreover, Duke Hamilton did not possess the influence to arrange a meeting between Churchill and Hess. Consequently, Churchill unequivocally declined to meet with Hess. The question here is, did Hitler know about the Hess mission to Britain? From day one, Hess denied Hitler's knowledge of the mission, which was a major reason why Churchill did not meet with him. Karl Heinz was Hess's assistant who delivered Hess's message to Hitler and was subsequently arrested by the Soviet Union. One of his handwritten notes was made public in 2011 by the Institute of German History in Moscow. Karl Heinz claimed in his note that Hess's mission was a military alliance with Britain, or at least neutralizing it before starting to fight the Soviet Union. Karl Heinz also noted that Hitler was not surprised by Hess's escape and that he only read the final sentence of the letter written by Hess. You can always deny any responsibility if this project fails. As if to say, you can claim I am insane. And that's what happened on the same day that Hess met Duke Hamilton. The German media labeled the deputy Fuhrer mentally unstable and attributed the decline in his mental state to wounds received in World War I. But there is evidence that Karl Heinz was subjected to torture during his interrogation, to the point where his hands were severely mutilated. Furthermore, his account conflicts with the majority of stories depicting Hitler hearing the news. One of Hitler's closest confidants, Albert Speer, who was a subordinate to Hess before taking over as Minister of Armaments and War Production, confirmed Hitler's reaction upon learning the news and expressed concern that it might be a prelude to a coup or create issues with his allies in Japan and Italy. In an interview with Speer after his release from prison, he denied labeling Hess as insane. Instead, he described Hess as slightly eccentric and hysterical. This description is similar to how British psychiatrists characterized Hess as mentally disturbed rather than insane. For the Hess family, Speer's testimony was considered a fact. In a 1995 recorded interview, the son of Rudolf Hess stated that Hitler was already aware of the trip and that the proof of that lies in the preparation for the journey and the fact that Hess was not targeted by any German defenses during his flight. Theories surrounding the main reason for Hess's trip to Britain during the most dangerous time of the war were on the rise. Some even claimed that the person who visited Britain was not Hess, but rather someone else who resembled him. This novel idea gained great popularity until DNA testing in 2019 conclusively demonstrated that the traveler to Britain was indeed Hess and not a different person. World War II ended in 1945 and Hitler committed suicide. Hess embarked on a new chapter in his life and was given a life sentence in the Nuremberg Trials on October 1, 1946, for two offenses, complicity with German officials in crimes and a crime against peace. Hess transitioned from a life of freedom to lifelong captivity in Spandau Castle. He was the seventh of seven Nazis held captive in this fortress. They received severe penalties and communication was outlawed between them. They were only allowed to spend 15 minutes with their family every two months and were forbidden from writing memoirs or reading newspapers. As time went on, some of them died and some were released. But by 1966, Hess remained the only prisoner in this castle. He was known as the most costly prisoner in the world. He was the sole inmate in the castle, guarded alternately by the four allied countries of America, Britain, the Soviet Union, and France. 
Furthermore, every person in the castle, from the guards to the cooks, was at his service. For approximately 21 years, he was overseen by a rotation of about 37 soldiers. One of the prison wardens, Eugene Byrd, wrote a book about his memories with Hess and named the book The Loneliest Man in the World. In the years that followed, the restrictions were relatively relaxed. A member of his family was allowed to visit him once a month, but these visits were conducted under surveillance. Additionally, he was permitted to read newspapers after the news had been edited to ensure that no information about Nazism or Nazis could reach him. In the 1980s, Hess had been imprisoned for 40 years and his health was deteriorating. There was a growing human sentiment to release him. People felt that he shouldn't have to spend more time behind bars, especially all by himself. Along with his family, Britain submitted 11 applications for his release, while the United States and France made 14 demands. In 1982, British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher wrote a letter to Leonid Brezhnev, the president of the Soviet Union, stating, There is, to my mind, no justification for keeping Hess in prison any longer. He is 88. He has been in prison for 40 years. He has been without the company of other prisoners for over 16 years. Humanitarian reasons demand that no one should be treated this way. Despite all of these recommendations, the Soviet Union steadfastly refused to release Hess under any circumstances, even though Hess had been cleared of charges of war crimes and the mass murder of Jews in extermination camps because he had left Germany before these atrocities occurred. However, it's important to note that Hess wasn't exempt from wrongdoing. He had signed the Nuremberg Laws, which prohibited the employment of Jews in government positions and the marriage of Jews to Germans. The Soviet Union had a consistent and clear attitude toward Nazis in general because 27 million Russians died during the Second World War. This extremism extended not only to Hess but also to other Nazi prisoners as they refused to release two Nazi prisoners even a minute before their scheduled release time. Additionally, the worst time for prisoners occurred during the Soviet Union's control of the prison system. In one of the most peculiar scenes in this story, during the Nuremberg trials, Hess stated that he was unrepentant and that he had the honor of working under the command of one of his people's greatest leaders. This demonstrated his sincere loyalty to Hitler even after Hitler's death and departure from power. This is one of the most remarkable tales of unwavering loyalty and genuine sincerity. He had no desire for power or wealth. Instead, he remained steadfastly loyal to Hitler, his ideologies, and the party never hesitating to make personal sacrifices for them. Hess remained in Spandau until his death on August 17, 1987, at the age of 93. On September 17, the four allies announced his suicide in a joint statement. Despite his death, substantial questions arose regarding the circumstances of his passing. Hess's family in particular asserted that a person of his age couldn't have committed suicide, and if he had, there might have been someone who assisted him. They speculated that British intelligence might have been involved in his death. Consequently, they called for an autopsy, but the results were inconclusive, leaving uncertainty about whether he was killed or not. The story didn't end with his death. Hess paid for his symbolic status in Nazism by having his grave transformed into a neo-Nazi shrine. Consequently, in July 2011, authorities demanded that his family remove his remains, burn them, and scatter the ashes into the sea. Additionally, Spandau Prison, where he spent about half of his life, was demolished immediately after his death, and a mall was built named the Britannia Center. However, it became known as Hesco, inspired by Tesco, the most well-known supermarket in Britain. This was the tale of one of the most devoted people to the most evil ideas. The lesson to be gleaned is that, before one becomes fanatical about any idea, it's essential to open the mind and ensure that one's convictions are virtuous, fostering personal growth and benefiting others both in one's lifetime and beyond. This, in essence, encapsulates the true meaning of a good life. It's time to hear from you in today's video. Please leave your comments and like the video so we can reach more amazing friends like you. And don't forget to subscribe to receive our new videos. Stay tuned for the next one.